So welcome to the second workshop for this uh, semester's series of the Workshop in Cultural Affairs. I'm Joanna Vronkovich, one of the co-directors here at the center, and we're happy to have you all back. So I'm happy to present our um, presenter for our, our speaker for today. This is Professor Felix Koenig from Carnegie Mellon University. He's at the Heinz School. And Felix is an assistant professor of economics and um, received his PhD from the London School of Economics. And he's talking today about superstar effects, evidence from the rollout of television. So with that, I will hand it over to you, Felix, and you can feel free to start. Thanks, Jonna. Um, very glad to be here and thanks for coming to my talk. So the topic um, is superstar effects, as Joanna already pointed out, and we're going to talk mainly about entertainers uh, during the rise of television. Um, this is a paper that's recently been published uh, in ARI, um, so you can you can look it up online. But the, I'll present the the short version of it, and then we can have a bit of a Q and A at the end. So the motivation for this paper, the general idea, is about it came from debates around inequality. So when I started this project, Piketty had just launched his book about the top 1% and the rise of the top 1% compared to the 99%. Um, and one of the key theories that's floating around in economics that could potentially explain why top incomes are exploding is the so-called superstar effect. Um, and the idea is that technologies can create these winner-take-all markets where a few hyper-successful individuals earn extraordinarily high incomes. Um, and that notion was sort of derived from observations in the entertainment sector in the 80s and even earlier, where some economists wrote down a model that tried to replicate what they observed happened to, to um, singers, uh, and, and and other actors during the introduction of recording technology. So, you know, the idea that you used to sing in front of a relatively small local audience and then recording technology made it possible to reach much, much bigger audiences and created these superstars uh, in some, some entertainment industries. Now that sort of notion was formalized into what's become known as the superstar idea um, and has been used pretty widely in economics to, um, to rationalize growth of incomes of the of the very top end of the distribution so people have used this model to um to to predict what what should happen to ceos ceos to lawyers to all sorts of other uh, occupations and found that this model is pretty powerful at explaining what what could happen um to top incomes but aside from these kind of calibration exercises the model had been largely untested so what i do in this paper is I go back to the original setting that inspired the superstar model um, and try to test it. So I'll try to implement an empirical analysis that tests whether new technologies in the entertainment sector create these sort of winner-take-all markets. Um, so preview of results, if we don't make it through all of my slides, um, I do find evidence that the launch of television led to dramatic rise of top incomes among entertainers. Um, so the ability to film uh, for television increased wages at the 99th percentile, so that's the, the highest earners, the 1% highest earners by around 18%. Um, and other predictions of the superstar model also are borne out in the data. So we see the wage distribution aside from the top 1% spreading out. So a few very highly successful top earners emerge, a broader set of entertainers that now have very modest incomes that lose out from this technical change. Um, the wage gains are disproportionate at the very top and it's kind of like a hockey stick effect that the impacts are, are dramatic for the for the superstars and then a little bit less as we move away from the superstars to the backup stars and so on. Um, and we see a decline of overall demand for entertainers. So similar to the kind of concerns people have been raising around AI, um, the launch of television replaced lots of Low, small key local entertainments with these, um, you know, stars that were broadcast over television airwaves. Um, and then I have some estimates about the magnitudes that suggest that the rise of television can explain a substantial share uh, of the increase of top incomes among entertainers in this period, which is the 50s in the US. Outline, skip through that. 
Um, superstar model is a formal model. So, you know, you probably the, the, the term maybe rings a bell or brings up some, some ideas, but there's a formal model that, that underlies it in economics. Um, the idea is that there's different types of actors. There are different levels of talent and you can rank them. There's the, the, the top talents all the way to the lesser talents. And on the other side of the market, there's different types of job opportunities, and they also have different characteristics. Some of them are like great, and some of them are less, uh, you know, have, have a smaller scale. And then in practice, the two get, get matched. So each of the job opportunities for simplicity only hires one actor, and um, in, in the job plus the actor together produce some show. Um, now, there's two, two results that, or three results that, that you get in this model, one is the positive assorted matching that the sort of the jobs that have the biggest scale that have the largest potential audience will hire the highest talents, will hire sort of the, the superstars. Um, and jobs that are smallest in scale will hire lower ranked talents and pay them lower wages. Um, and you can derive the predict some predictions about what wages look like in this world. And basically you get a relation here between the wage W and the sort of scale of the job or the the quality of the job. Um, now, you could estimate this. You can regress wages on some measure of potential audience of a show, and you know you can estimate how changes in audience size would impact wages. Uh, but the problem is it's hard to get exogenous changes in S in the in the sort of audience size that a show could get. Um, the second thing that's difficult is um, it's hard to measure the primitive S. Um, and the third thing that's difficult is a simple correlation between audience size and wages is not necessarily direct evidence for superstar effects. You know, that correlation could be justified by other economic models. So my paper does, does a couple of things to address those three problems. Um, and I'll talk you through them um, as we go along. But let me first introduce you to the setting and the data. because I think that's the most novel and exciting to, to many of you. So the setting is an iconic example of this type of technical change that enables uh, bigger scale production. And that's the launch of television in the US, which happened in the 1940s and 50s, all the way, and I have data all the way through the 70s. Um, the idea here is that TV, among other things, changed how many people an entertainer could reach with one, with one, uh, with one show. Um, and that dramatically changed the wage distribution in entertainment. Um, now that the launch of te television uh, was a major disruption in the entertainment industry is probably not news to many of you. Uh, here it's featured on the front page of the Time magazine, uh, describing sort of how dramatically uh, entertainment changed at the time. Mo people moving away from sort of traditional local entertainment like theater, uh, bars, and so on. Um, and spending more of their time in um, watching television. Now, the crucial variation that I'll exploit, and that's maybe less known, is that TV filming wasn't happening in the way, at least not to the same degree as it does today. So at the time, there wasn't like a hugely national uh, network in place. Um, TV was rolled out slowly across space. So the first television stations uh, were antennas that broadcast uh, via airwaves so unlike you know sort of cable or satellite television they were constrained by the physics of antennas uh, and the earliest stations were only available in in specific local markets so you know new york was one of the first places that uh, where television became available the second thing that's crucial um so what, for, number one is that there was regional differences in who had and who didn't have television the second thing that was different is local filming was much more important than it is today. So today, most channels, you know, are network affiliated. They also were historically. Um, but historically, uh, the network content was a much smaller share of overall content. So there's a much bigger component of your daily TV schedule that was made up um, of, of content that was produced at the antenna or at the local TV station. Um, at the time. That had to do with other technological issues that made recording difficult um, and rebroadcasting re recorded shows difficult and, and relaying live shows from shore to shore wasn't possible till the mid 50s. Um, so there were all these technical constraints that meant um, television um, wasn't as national as modern television. 
Um, so that means the scale of television wasn't as big as maybe today's television, but the good outcome for empirical identification is it means that the launch of a TV antenna in one area meant local entertainers became sort of small scale superstars or could become small scale superstars because the antenna had to hire these local entertainers to produce local shows. Um, so what am I gonna exploit? Well, I'm gonna exploit that different areas got antennas at different times, different local labor markets in the US got uh, TV. Who decided whether they got TV? Well, it was the FCC, a regulator, uh, that determined at what point which local labor market received TV. And I'm gonna exploit that there's idiosyncrasies in this rollout process that meant some got it slightly earlier than other places. And then we can use that as treatment and control to study the impact of television. The second thing that's nice for identification is that the rollout plan wasn't implemented as intended. There was an interruption similar to the government shutdown that we just talked about where the FCC just stopped the entire rollout. Um, so we have a bunch of places that for a time period narrowly missed out on TV launches. And that's gonna be nice for placebo tests. We can sort of um, verify that the effects that we that we find in the data are really driven by TV and not by sort of spurious trends that are going on in the kind of places where TV, the TV is early to, lo to launch. Um, and the final piece of variation that I'll exploit is that this local localized television is obviously eventually superseded by modern television where the networks dominate programming. Um, so eventually there's this decline in local production um, and you see less of these local superstar effects and, and filming moves away from local production to more centralized productions in, in you know on the coasts. Um, the final thing is we also have like variation across occupations. TV should only affect entertainers unless, you know, we can do placebo tests with other occupations that have nothing to do with, with TV. Um, so to give you a stylized idea of, of what I'm talking about, if you think about kind of um, performance entertainment, pre, the pre-TV era was characterized by a variety of different types of entertainment that you could consume. Uh, one popular version of this was vaudeville. Um, which was live entertainment, you know, kind of circus acts and so on, clowns, um, animal shows, all, all that kind of variety entertainment. Um, that was an extremely uh, popular form of entertainment, you know, in the in the eighteen hundreds, even in the early nineteen hundreds. And that was characterized by local live performances. A lot of these circuses rotated around across uh, different cities. Um, then I want you to think about phase two of, of the data that we study being this era, era of localized television where you would have you know, a local performer here standing in front of a camera and live relaying their, their theater play to the local audience, however far their antenna could reach. So if you were based in, in Kansas and there was a TV station in Kansas, they would basically film the local some local play and broadcast it to a local area. And that sort of localized era lasts from around the launch of television, which the first station launched in 1941, till the mid 50s. In the mid 50s, this giant machine was invented. And, and I like to like to sort of make the point that this machine replaced this human. This machine is a videotape recorder, an early version of a videotape recorder, um, which now made it possible for this Kansas TV station to rather than employing a local entertainer, they now could show, um, you know, a show from from um, LA and uh, and other other locations, so they record it and play it at the at the appropriate time. Um, so the the TV recorder, the the VCR, the videotape recorder for commercial use was was pioneered in '55 and pretty much adopted immediately across the country. There's three periods: that's kind of pre-TV era localized TV era and the national TV era. Um, and that, that's gonna be the variation that the study will use. Second piece of variation is geographic, like which area here receives TV. And I digitalized historic records of what the FCC did. So what was their rule that determined which area gets TV first and which, which comes later. And they've fortunate for me published these, these rules um, which I was able to digitalize. Basically what the FCC did is prioritized areas that were 
had higher population densities. And you can sort of see that ranked here. There's two criteria, population density and proximity to the to the next station. And then they ranked places. So we know which one, which locations were the next in line, and they would just sort of work through their stack of applications, treating one place after the other. So we have variation in when these TV effects or these TV launches happen across US uh, local labor markets. Second thing is this interruption that I already mentioned. So this plan didn't get implemented. The reason was that there was issues in the regulator model of how fast stations have to be apart. Signal, there's a problem with signal uh, transmission that if you have two stations using the same spectrum, if they're too close, the signal overlaps and you just get scrambled signal. No one can watch anything. So they had to make sure that stations are far enough apart. And it turned out that the model they used to calculate what was a safe distance kind of was wrong. Um, so they realized having these problems. So they stopped the rollout and read it their you know, physics and did a bunch of field studies to figure out what the safe distance should be. And what's nice for the study is we have this unexpected period, the unexpected interruption um, where a bunch of places should have had TV but didn't get it. Um, so this is what this looks like uh, over time. This is the number of stations being launched. Uh, there's a you know, kind of 10 stations per quarter, roughly, uh, leading up to this freeze. And by late 1948, um, station launches just go to zero, and they remain zero for actually a remarkably long time. So it took them, you know, three, four years to, to figure out a new process. And then I stopped the, the time series, but then they restart launches. So we have this sort of window of time where we have stations that, that, that are ghost stations that should have been live, but weren't allowed to go live. Um, so I geolocate them and you know figure out which which locations are affected by these ghost stations. Um, that's what it looked like on the map. Um, red triangles are these ghost stations, the blocked stations, and circles are active stations. And the size uh, indicates the number. So uh, you know a bigger size means there are lots of blocked stations here, and you know New York has lots of active stations. Uh, this is a snapshot in 1949, so at the time, right when that freeze went into place. Um, okay, so this is the type of setting and variation that the study will look at. Um, tell you a little bit more about the outcome data, how are we going to measure the, wage, the wages of entertainers? Um, well, I collect data at the local labor market level. I take the definition of local labor markets from other scholars that done this before, there's 722 in the US. Um, I used US census data, which is available at a decadal level um, and covers everyone in the US. And then, uh, you know, look at who is an entertainer as an occupation and uh, measure their wages uh, in each of these four decades. I combine that data on, on, on the wage distribution in these local labor markets with the information about local TV availability so I digitalize these archival records that I've shown you pictures of um, that tell me whether a TV station launched or at what time it launched um, and whether they've been affected by ghost stations or not. Then I combine those two data sources with a third data source that lets me track how big an audience is. So I digitalize records that, um, that, that show how many people would fit in the biggest local live venue and I add to that how many people a local TV station could reach. So I can measure how much bigger the audience gets once you move from like being a life entertainer to, to a TV broadcast entertainer. Um, all right, some summary statistics about what's happening to wage inequality at this time. In the overall US economy, this is showing you the 95th percentile. So like a very high income to the median. Um, in the overall economy is, is actually a period of declining inequality or relatively flat inequality. And then the blue line shows you what's happening to top earners relative to the median in among actors. Um, and you can see that that really is taking off in this time period. So the top actors are earning much, much more than the median. And that gap is growing dramatically uh, during this roll-up period. You can all also look at the full distribution. Uh, the other thing that's going on is if you focus on the number of jobs, um, in this period, well, for performance entertainers, the type of people that now can be broadcast on TV, this is actually flat lines. While 
if you compare that to other entertainment occupations, entertainment is booming. Like people are spending more money, they're getting richer. Lots of people are starting being employed in entertainment, but that's not true in this area that's experiencing this technical transformation through television. So we do see flatlined job growth uh, among entertain performance entertainers. The empirical implementation is, is a difference in different strategy. So I'm exploiting well, what I'm studying is wages in a local labor market before and after it receives television. Um, and I'm exploiting that different labor markets get television at different times. So control for local labor market fixed effects, time fixed effects are allowed to vary by occupation. And then I look at what happens to that local labor market when TV is introduced in the year, in the decade after and then decade before. Um, and the first outcome I'm going to look at is extreme pay in entertainment. Specifically, I look at the share of entertainers that make it to the top 1%. Um, so if you look at that, you can see, well, normalize the pre-period to zero, that there's this explosion in super highly paid entertainers in local areas where TV is launched. And that those jobs, those extremely high paid jobs in entertainment disappear in those local labor markets after the launch of the videotape. So when filming gets national and these jobs move to the coast, the areas where the TV stations are based don't have disproportionately many top earners anymore. But they do in this period when, when local television stations had to employ local entertainers. Um, so the first result is, you know, the, the, the period of local television filming um, led to this dramatic increase in, um, in, in, in high paid entertainers in areas where local TV filming took place. In terms of magnitude, um, this is, you know, a five percentage point increase in the share of entertainers that reach the top 1%. That, that's very large. The baseline is, is, is much smaller. So this means the share of entertainers nearly doubles that, that yeah, paid extremely high wages. All right, let me skip over some of these robust, or let me focus on one specific robustness check that I um, that I oops, that I uh, introduced. That was the idea that we have these ghost stations. So I'm going to study um, what happened in labor markets that should get TV but didn't because of that interruption. And what you see in those areas is nothing happens to top pay among entertainers. There's no increase in top pay among entertainers in places that sh were, were slated to receive TV, but, but don't. Um, okay, so that was the first result. So TV led to this uh, rise of extremely high paid, extremely well paid uh, entertainers. But we can derive some richer predictions from the model because, you know, just the rise in top incomes is, you know, it's interesting, but maybe it's not the most compelling evidence that this is really the, the so-called superstar effects, you could have a different model that generates rise of top incomes. And that's a simple increase in demand. Let's imagine TV just increased demand for entertainment. Um, an increase in demand in most economic models just raises everyone's wage. You know, if there's more demand for entertainers, everyone's wage goes up, increasing wages at the top. So just focusing on top earners in itself is maybe not sufficient evidence. So let's uh, expand the idea a little bit and let's think about what the superstar model pr predicts about other parts of the earning distribution. So I plotted here different parts of the earning distribution. The 99th percentile is so the highest paid part of the distribution. Zero is the lowest part of the distribution. And what the model predicts that a technology, what technical change does is it boosts extreme pay. So the very highest paid uh, jobs become uh, more prevalent but it erodes kind of the middle of the income distribution. So there's fewer jobs that are paid well. Um, there's a few jobs now that pay extremely high wages um, and you might see a, a slight increase in the low paid sector. So it, basically the prediction is yes, extreme growth at the top, but a polarization elsewhere. You see hollowing out of the middle and the growth of the low paid sector. So, I test those predictions. So far, I've shown you results for that one dot up here, what happened to extreme pay. Now I go on and test the predictions um, for other parts of the pay distribution. Same strategy, comparing labor markets where TV station launched to labor markets where a TV station is not yet launched. But rather than studying what share of entertainers are paid 
in the top 1% have extremely high pay. I'm studying how many entertainers are in these other deciles, like, you know, are in the median decile or in, in the decile between the 60s and 70th percentile and so on. So I just repeat the same different diff strategy and I show you the coefficients. Each of these dots is a different regression. Um, this is the regression I've already shown you. The entertainers in these extremely high paid income levels there's more entertainers that get paid at these extremely high income levels. Uh, if you focus on the 95th to 99th percentile of the earnings distribution, that's still pretty pretty good pay. Um, you see a slight growth, but it's only marginally significant. If you go down a little bit further and focus on very well paid entertainers between the 90, you know, with an income in the 90 to 95th percentile, well, here you already have a coefficient that's negative. So, you know. The first result is, yes, TV created these extremely high-paid superstars, maybe some backup stars, but if you're moving down even just to the top 10%, top 10th percentile, um, the number of jobs in that, that pay that kind of salary are, are slightly decreasing, albeit insignificant. If we look at the median pay ranges, sort of between the median, the 75th, or the 75th, the 90th percentile, you see a decline in jobs. So fewer entertainers get a salary that puts them um, in an average pay bracket in the US. And you do see a rise in the number of entertainers in the low paid sector. So the overall impact on the distribution here is the launch of TV creates a few very handsomely paid entertainers. There's a little bit of a growth of these sort of backup stars that get salaries between the 95th and 99th percentile, but you see a big decline in jobs that pays, you know, average salaries, and you see a rise of the uh, of the number of entertainers, maybe the aspirational stars that paid actually very little, um, far below the median. Um, the second thing that we can test is employment losses. So when it comes to technology, um, you know, there's the writer strike and the, the actor strike right now. A lot of the debate is around employment loss. Um, well, TV should have similar impacts if we think that TV created these superstars that now that the job that used to be done by many local entertainers, you know, people, the initial Time Magazine article that I put on the, one of the first slides said, oh, people stopped going to bars and 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 and, and other venues and instead spent their time watching television. Well, you should see that in employment numbers. Um, so what I'll, what I'll study is the employment impact of the launch of television. And here you use slightly different variations. So previously we used the variation of whether your local labor market was a place where entertainers were hired to appear on television. Now I'm gonna use variation that, that shows me whether people in your local area could watch television. So the previous variation was variation in whether the you know, TV would, would hire or produce in your local labor market. This variation is focusing on whether people, consumers could substitute local entertainment for television watching. And what this map shows you is um, in, in dark blue areas that counties that could watch television in 1950, uh, in light blue areas that could not watch television. So there was no transmission, no, no signal in those areas. And in shaded blue, these areas that by 1950 should have had a TV station operating, but didn't because of that interruption that we talked about earlier. So we have three types of areas, the areas that can, the areas that can't, and the areas that also can't, but should have, should have been able to. Um, now let's study what happens to employment. Um, well, if we study employment in the areas that do get TV and compare them to all the other areas, you see that employment pre-post TV declines by around 13 log points. So that's 13% fewer entertainers, 13% uh, fewer people work in entertainment after the launch of a local television station or after television becomes an option. Um, now we can control for stuff, it doesn't really change, but maybe the most interesting or most compelling result is to check what happens to entertainment in places that should have got a TV station but didn't. So we can check whether places that get TV are just on a different trend. So maybe just employment is declining in entertainment and it's declining faster in urban areas where TV was launched earlier. 
Well, it turns out that that's not the case. We can do this placebo test with stations, with places that ought to have had television and see what happens to these ghosts, what happens to places that get a ghost station, so the station is built but doesn't launch. Well, in those cases, employment is actually unaffected. Insignificant effects, the point estimate is, is slightly positive, but there's no decline in employment when TV stations don't launch, but we do see this decline in employment when a TV station does launch. So in summary, on the employment side, the paper finds that the launch of television does reduce overall employment. So it created that hollowing out of the middle with extreme wages at the top. And on top of that, it finds that the launch of television reduced the number of people uh, that are employed uh, in entertainment. And maybe I should, should come back to, to the definition of entertainment. So I here focus explicitly on performance entertainers. So this is not, um, you know, not, not all type of type of entertainment jobs. It's the kind of jobs that you might think are close substitutes to, to watching television. Um, okay, so those are the sort of main main results of the paper. I've talked for uh, good, roughly 30 minutes. So the main results of the paper are, we saw the television led to this hollowing out of the middle, rise of extreme wages at the top, rise of low paid sector at the bottom, created fewer job opportunities in entertainment consistent with what the superstar model would suggest. Um, maybe I'll open up the floor for questions. I've got a lot more data, a lot more results that I'm happy to pull up uh, as we go along. Um, but okay. thank you, <clears throat> Felix. Yeah, and we can go back and forth if you'd like to keep on going and there are questions. So whatever works best for the rest of the conversation. Um, I do want to go back to one of the comments you just made which is the type of occupations that you include um yeah. in job loss so i'm wondering to what extent were new occupations created that you're not that you're not capturing here yeah that's right so um well so there's two two components to this question um in entertainment the kind of workers that were hired to appear on television, especially in early television, were very close to the type of entertainers that were around before. So it wasn't uncommon that a, a vaudeville show would literally be put on TV. So they would just film the sort of the same kind of entertainers doing the same thing that they did before. That sort of shifted over time. They, you know, the TV it became more of a of its own art form. Um, you know, the bigger TV became, the entertainers become became more specialized. But largely, um, there was a big transition of people that used to be um, used to be actors before transitioned into becoming TV entertainers. Now, there's a separate set of jobs um, that TV did create that didn't exist before, mainly on the technology side. So I'm not really studying the technology side at all. Mm -hmm. But you know, camera, the people that you know did the filming, light technicians, audio. So there's a lot more jobs um, outside of entertainment that, that were created. Um, maybe one caveat on that is the number of jobs in total in aggregate is just diminishing, it was vanishingly small relative to the size of the entertainment sector. The entertainment sector is actually a big chunk of, of the economy, a significant chunk of the economy. The number of you know, light technician jobs is relatively modest. Mm -hmm. So it just could never, you know, it couldn't, you could, the, the overall job creation effect will offset some of the job losses, but it wouldn't totally offset it. Um, mm -hmm. um, yeah, feel free to everyone to put questions in the chat, or you can just raise hands and I'll call on people. And I have a question from Michael Rushton. Okay, thanks very much, Felix. That was, uh, that was really interesting and it, uh, super interesting. And it caused me to rethink sort of a standard story I've been telling in my class. So I, I have to rewrite my lecture notes now. So here's the story that, that I used to tell. When we look at um, Hollywood and what television meant to Hollywood was that the major studios, which up until 1950 used to produce not only feature films, but also sort of B movies that would be seen before the feature film serials that would be seen before the B-movie, sort of a whole night's entertainment at the cinema. 
And the story I've always told is that, well, with the introduction of television, people weren't interested in going out to the cinema to see sort of low production values, no name actors in serials and B movies. So the studio shifted to only focusing on feature films. That was going to be the only thing they made now. And so the very top actors, the really big stars, got a lot of bargaining power and their incomes went way up. But they had no interest in doing television at all. And so I was wondering if it was the case that, well, did the studios who had all these actors, after all, as employees, simply said, well, we don't really have work for you anymore if you're not really a star. And they all dispersed across the United States. So if we take a city like Denver, which I, I think in your map had a, a live television station, but at that time was, it was not the sophisticated Denver we have now. It was pretty much a cow town. Um, did you have former Hollywood actors kind of moving in to take advantage of, well, now there is live TV here, there will be jobs. Uh, they move in to take advantage of that. And then when television production subsequently becomes centralized, towards the end of the 50s and early 60s, they then leave, they, they move back. Um, so I'm not sure if, if that story actually works, but I'm trying to meld what you've said with what I've traditionally thought about what happened in Hollywood. Mm. Yeah, that's a very interesting point. I think your story is, is largely correct. So like the, the shift in Hollywood, I think that's entirely correct. So the, the second question of whether these people that lost their job in Hollywood dispersed to the periphery and kind of took up those periphery jobs. Um, so I don't know if I, I looked at migration some. Um, I don't have the perfect answer for you, but my data seems to suggest that that's not the main driving force. So most of those local uh, local TV stars were people from the local area. And that in part had to do with the way entertainment at the time operated was there was a lot more sort of localism in entertainment. So they, they relied much more on, on you know, location specific jokes and anecdotes that people could identify with. Um, and that required, I guess, people that, that, you know, spoke the local language or knew the local area. Um, so it wasn't that one reason why you might not get the effect that you're describing is that, the Hollywood substars, the, 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 the tier one down, didn't have the skill set to become a sort of local star because they didn't have the local knowledge. That said, it could still have been a, a factor. It just might not be the the, the main kind of driver of, of local talent. Um, Neil, I have to see your hand up. <clears throat> yeah, I'm I'm going to go down to the weeds a little bit, or down to in, into the weeds rather than at the higher level that Michael was just at. As one who used census data in looking at artists for, for many, many years, my question would be, what is the impact, especially since your, your uh, wage data goes over a significant period of time, of the top coding of people's earn earnings and income? And how did you deal with that? And secondly, you know, I'm looking at the the occupations you've included in the ent entertainers' occupations. Many of these people <clears throat> in this marketplace were multiple job holders, and it was difficult for the census and for the individuals to assign themselves to an arts occupation versus some, you know, entertainers' occupation to some other occupation. How did you handle both of these particular issues? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that. I feel like people don't ask me this enough because I spent most of my time dealing with those things <laughs> and, and people gleam over it. So uh, top coding, the first question. Top coding is um, changes over time um, and means that we can't observe the wage above a certain wage level. Um, now, there's there's a couple of ways to deal with this. The, the, the main results that I showed you on top earners we're always about the share of entertainers that reach some threshold. Um, the threshold I, I use is the threshold of being in the top 1% of the US wage distribution. Um, and that happens to be below the top code in every year. Um, if I were to, if I ideally, if I didn't have top coded data, I would want to look at the number of millionaires or some equivalent threshold um, that I can't do. The second version of doing um, 
trying to get a more direct measure of the income of the of the top person is you know you could do some uh, extrapolation. So what a lot of people do in this literature is they, they they impose Pareto tails and then estimate what the tail you see kind of what the wage distribution looks up leading up to the top quarter and you know how many people are top quarter and then you can kind of predict where where their wages should lie. Um, so you could do that. I do some of that. There's one of the robustness tables buried in the paper um, where I do this with Pareto or other types of distributions. Um, that has the advantage that you um, can directly measure an income level effect. So you can measure how much by, you know, how many dollars did the income increase rather than this sort of percentage effect that I, I've shown you. Um, so what I've shown you was what share of entertainers meets a certain threshold is a top paid entertainer. Um, the other uh, variant would be looking at how much the incomes increased there you have to make an assumption of what the people above the top code would have earned the, um, and um, that number like how much the incomes increase in percentage terms is about 18 percent if you make the Pareto distribution assumption so that's the idea that the tail looks like a Pareto distribution which is what most of the top income people think it does um Second question was about the uh, entertainer occupation categories. That's right. So um, your question was um, people with multiple jobs. Um, the occupation category is the main job that I use. Um, so those are people that um, you derive the, the largest share of their income from the entertainment job. So that would underestimate the number of people um, that are engaged in any form in entertainment because it doesn't capture the kind of people who do it as a side gig, the kind of people who play like a Friday evening gig at the local pub, um, but have a, have a full-time job. Um, so what does that mean for the results? Well, for the top end of the distribution, it's not terribly relevant. Typically the kind of people who, you know, get very high incomes are, are you know, would be correctly coded. Um, the people at the bottom end of the distribution that might be more relevant. Um, so we might underestimate how many low paid uh, workers are engaged in some form in entertainment. Um, now for the results that I've shown you, they're all difference in different equations, right? So they, they're comparing what's happening in one area compared to another area. Um, so anything that is just a, a, an overall problem in the data set hopefully will cancel out. Um, so it, it, while it's definitely a problem if you want to quantify magnitudes, if you want to say, you know, this many people are engaged in entertainment, it wouldn't affect these difference estimators as long as it's a, it's a common feature uh, of the entertainment labor market that afflicts all labor markets in the, in the US. So that's how I think about the occupational coding issue. The second issue that you didn't bring up with occupational coding is um, occupational codes also change over time. So fortunately, actors um, are one of the categories that are consistent. <laughs> um, that's also true for athletes um, and dancers, I think. So, But some of the categories disappear and get subsumed in other categories. So uh, entertainers not elsewhere classified, like here, here's the list. Entertainers not elsewhere classified at some point subsume some of the other categories. I think athletes are only coded as a separate categories in the 40s and 50s and no longer in the 60s and 70s when they're subsumed in entertainers not elsewhere classified. Um, if you add them all up, they should be a consistent set of occupations that captures the same, uh, the same type of people uh, over time, which may of course not be the case. Again, if it's something that is just a change in time that affects all labor markets equally, the regression will take care of it. Um, but yeah, so I've, I've tried to, I've tried my best to code something consistently, but it's definitely an issue with anyone working with censuses that, you know, making things comparable over time is, is, is tricky. Thank you, Felix. Um, so Ning Ning has a question in the chat. Your paper uses the scale-related technical change model. You also mentioned that there are other models focused on skill-biased skill technical change, task-specific technical change. 
I wonder how do your other models deal with reduced cost effects? Is there a model focused on reduced cost technical change? Yeah, so <clears throat> yeah, all of them in some way, so I'm not sure what, what exactly you mean by reduced cost technical change. All of them in some way think about technical change as reducing cost of something. The scale related technical change reduces the cost of producing at scale. So, you know, if you think about this with the concrete example, um, a vaudeville entertainer could also reach thousands of people. They just had to go on the circuit, circuit and, and travel around. It was pretty costly and time, time intensive. Um, a TV entertainer could do the same thing much quicker than did one show and reach tons of people. So in some ways you can think of the scale related technical changes reducing the cost of scaling up your production. Um, now that some of the other models like the task biased technical changes typically think of technical changes reducing the cost of some specific substitute for one type of labor. So think about the classic task model, um, routine jobs get replaced with technology. And there the idea is effectively that technology that can do the jobs that used to be done by routine workers, like you know, uh, tightening screws and so on, those types of technologies like screwdrivers got way cheaper. Um, so I think all of these models uh, implicitly think about reducing cost of something. The question of how they differ is what is the something? Uh, how does it show up in the model? Like, and that that's that's the difference between the models effectively. Yeah, that's that was something. So um, there was also questions that came up. I think for me about, um, and I think others for, like what the um, the the idea that tech is is essentially just um, like growing the scale of the market, right? And so. I kept on thinking about obviously the analogies to what's happening today, but a question came in over the chat um, about the like national markets versus local markets. And obviously that's something that you look at at your paper, but thinking about how you were, you know, it, back in the day, these markets were local and regional. And there was this idea that local markets were sort of playing against each other, but we're now looking at these national markets and how we're dealing with a little bit of a different situation now where um, there's competition across markets and then this idea of monopoly power. So I'm just wondering sort of taking your paper and then applying it to the structure of the market today, which is much more national, global. I mean, what's the difference in um, what we see in your paper versus how the model applies today? Terribly worded question, but Maybe Doug, if you wanted to jump in and clarify that. <laughs> I mean, I think that catch that the uh, the idea is about sort of monopoly power on the on the supplier side, on the employer side, and how that might have changed in the last sixty years, uh, and whether you're able to sort of play off. So one of the one of the narratives I hear about the current uh, strikes and debates is the strong power that the uh, couple of the large studio style producers have in terms of information. They know, they know streaming revenues, but the uh, performers don't. And it's a, those sorts of issues. And it, it could get mitigated in a world where you can be playing Denver off against Dallas. Uh, how does that play out? Do you think? Yeah, I think that's, that's exactly right. So uh, a lot of the current debate is around monopsony power of the, of the big, big studios. Um, so um, yes, I thought about this, a bunch um, and I tried to well so there's two two questions one is sort of what can we learn from this period is it very different to today's period the answer is almost certainly yes like that just you know about everything is different um, but um, is there something well the thing I thought about is, is there something within that period that I've data on that maybe helps us understand how this monopsony power pans out in a labor market for entertainers and one thing I did look at is um um is this idea that in some local labor markets there's only one tv station that captures the entire market and in others the rollout 
places more than one station in that market. So then you have two compete potential employers. You can work for either of those stations and they have to compete with each other. And the results are actually very dramatic. <laughs> if you um, look at um, the case where there is, well, this was the, the baseline results that I've shown you. Those are the 6%, 5% increase in the, in the share of entertainers with extreme incomes. If you look though at labor markets where there's only one TV station, the benefits to workers, the sort of extreme income growth just doesn't show up. We get insignificant effects. The, 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 you know, the point estimate is pretty small and it only shows up in the labor markets where there's at least a second employer. So another way of putting this, another way of reading this is to say, well, yes, this technical change generates the opportunity to scale up production, but if you can only do it through one specific employer, they're not going to share the rents with you. <laughs> the only time when employer or the workers actors here really benefit is if there's two potential employers that have to compete over the over the local talent. Um, so this is what this kind of data clip gets at. So if you take that at face value, it's exactly the story you guys were alluding to that imperfect competition or monopsony power can can totally append the impact of technologies because firms might just pocket all of the the benefits from from the scale. Um, I think I have a little bit of a clarification question, but also just going back to the impacts that you see on employment. Um, yeah. Those are what are probably most surprising to me here. Um, and this probably relates to the idea of like the substitutability of talent, because in superstar economies, we tend to think that if there's less substitutability between producers, then it gives rise to, it's much more likely you'll see a superstar economy. So I'm starting to think about um, like all the local, the local TV stations and how they were all potentially distinct, right? And so that makes sense to me. There's these discriminating tastes that are, again, kind of pairing these local, these regional TV stations against each other. So, but I guess it, for me, I, I keep on getting kind of stopped at the part where we're actually seeing these negative employment impacts. I would assume that you would start to see these positive employment impacts, basically more people entering into the market are providing um, less sort of um, more opportunity to have these discriminating tastes, which rises to these superstar effects. So does that make sense? Like, I'm just a little bit confused about what's the, like the mechanism or the theory behind why these negative effects of, of employment are happening here. Yeah, so the, the way I think of the negative employment effect is, you know, if you think about the, cons the, the consumer here, the, the person who consumes entertainment, Yeah. Um, they were they used to be dispersed across many different entertainers entertainers um, in in local life venues where you know simplifying that there were obviously cinemas and, and other things that weren't local life but simplified they were going to bars they were going to you know if you've read bowling alone they, they were maybe went bowling um, they they engaged in all these like uh, types of entertainment activities where one worker would only work with a relatively small audience. Um, now they spend their time, everyone spends their time with the same person, the same uh, TV superstar. Now you're saying, well, not everyone is with the same because there's discriminating tastes and there might be different TV stations that cater to different subtastes. Um, but um, so that I agree with you, that would push in the opposite direction. But the question is, which of these effects dominates? Is it just yeah. that you know, 10 bowling alleys the, the 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 sort of the number of people that kept ten bowling alleys busy you now all watch the same person, or they watch four different people catering to a taste. Um, you know, there's kind of two effects. There's the one effect that means those people move towards television entertainers, and then there's the diver uh, diversity of content. Well, and then there's the sort of collective consumer effect of having access to more. So having greater access to the same things, which like, if you think about like Taylor Swift, right? Like the whole Swifties thing developed yeah. because 
I, you like Taylor Swift, so I'm going to like Taylor Swift. And now everybody loves Taylor Swift. Like there's this collective taste influence that happens too. For sure. So yeah, exactly. So the model that I write down in the paper doesn't, doesn't feature that. It's just sort of, there's different, your talent is independent of how many, your, your attractiveness is to, to your consumers independent of how many other people watch yeah. it. You um, but you're absolutely right. In practice, there's a sort of like a communal consumption externality. I want to be able to talk to you about what we did, you know, what we, yeah. what we saw on Friday. Uh, and, um, which I think I'd have to work through it, but I think that just amplifies the same type of effect. The, the easier it gets to all consume the same thing, it'll just make more and more people wanting to consume. Yeah, right. Yeah, and that makes sense to me on the consumption side, but again, like on the producer side, I think I'm not entirely convinced why those negative employment impacts happen. I, I see, like you're talking about the offsetting of what's happening locally versus what's happening nationally, but I guess I would have to sort of see whether or not that's that's actually true. Yeah, so I, I think the diversity of programming is becoming much more important in today's technology, where like, you know, Spotify or Netflix can can produce a sort of huge variety of different tastes. Television was sort of different. You know, this variation I'm talking about here is one versus more than one station. Most in this most of this time period, there's at most sort of four, maybe eight stations. So it's not, you know, the, the maximum number of tastes that they could cater to is much, much smaller than what you think about today. Yeah. So maybe yeah. that's some time period specific. That's definitely me. Yeah, that makes a difference. Doug. Yeah, just to riff on this a little bit more, I mean, as you see the employment effects, at least in theory, is it is there sort of a zero sum to this? Or do you think in aggregate it, it's shrinking total employment? Because one way you get the negative effects in the middle range is that essentially the high, high end has taken some of the resources that were going to the middle range and those re middle range people then shift down and now they're in the low, the low quartile. Uh, but the total employment hasn't necessarily shifted. And that's a different story than... Uh, that sort of zero sum model versus a model where actually aggregate employment falls and it just falls fastest in the middle. How do that's, you see that's right. that's, These are distinctive predictions, exactly. So that you could get that hollowing out picture without any employment loss. You could just have people from the middle moving to the low end and, and, and the top end and, and hollowing out and you don't have any employment predictions. That's actually how a lot of... Um, technical change models operate that you just look at the distribution and you don't think about employment losses um yeah the employment loss depends a little so in the model if you just think about the theory it depends a little bit on the outside option um if you know if your outside option is constant more people that that kind of get pushed towards the bottom will actually rather than having a low income in entertainment will decide well at that income level i'd rather not be an entertainer i'd rather work i don't know in some some other profession um, right and to me, I'm kind of interested in what happens to the surpluses with the technological shifts. For instance, in a monopsony model, if more of the surpluses are kept by non-producers and non-consumers, that should actually hollow out and leave less resources as a whole for the more, less surplus as a whole for the producers and the uh, and the audience. So you might end up shrinking the total size of employment there, just because the big sort of capitalists uh, have grabbed more of the resources. But if it's not the case, it may just be a sort of redistribution holding it fixed. Again, not notwithstanding all the other outside options and those other aspects that certainly matter as well. Yeah. Yeah, this, so there's an, an extension to this sort of superstar model where you bring in capital and there's been some work on the like fall in labor share. So then you're then you not just talking about, the, what I've been talking about is purely within, within the labor market, you know, what are the returns to the employees effectively? Um, but you can try to also think about what's the split between workers and investors. Um, and then you get also interesting predictions. I don't have great data on this. I've done some stuff where I try to estimate what revenues TV stations were getting and what sort of <laughs> revenues local venues were making before. Um, but it's kind of crude. You, you know, you have to you have to basically translate eyeballs, the number of people watching a show, to some sort of money metric. Um, which is how they priced ads at the time. So, you know, TV made money through ads and the amount they charged was based on how many people, you know, on the ratings. 
Um, so it maybe is a decent pro approximation, but I don't have, you know, it, it's an approximation. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, well, to me, it's all one of the interesting parts of the scale technology shift where you start shifting, you know, more and more towards streaming or to things with zero marginal cost of transmission. You get no ticket sales, so revenues in some ways that shrink. And you can you can use the same three performers. One Taylor Swift will cover us all, and we're all sated. Thank you, Taylor. Uh, and it's a different model than 1940 for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Felix. It was really lovely hearing this uh, paper um, in real time. So thank you. Um, thank you to everybody who also came and for your questions. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. These were phenomenal questions. Um, I'm really excited to have a entertainment expert audience <laughs> <laughs> well come back and and see us yes we're happy to also have you just part of this network now so it was great to hear your paper for sure so thanks everybody and come join us in a couple of weeks we're going to do a live interview with michael rushton on his new book the moral foundations of public funding for the arts so i hope you'll join us then and until then have a wonderful day and the rest of your week all right bye-bye <laughs> Thanks, Alex. Thank you.